And one other thing that I wanted to bring up, beginning of new year, I thought I put one here, I did. Back on the table, there's the preborn ministry envelopes, and you can actually go online for that. What's really cool about this ministry, they've released a year-end report that since the drive that we got involved in, where we started sharing that ministry with you, over 10,000 babies have been saved from aborted, from being aborted. And not only that, but the mothers of those children are still being ministered to and being helped with walking out what it means to be a parent or whatever choice that they make after that, as long as that life is safe. And what's so amazing about this ministry, unfortunately, the, this phrase gets tossed around politically and it gets to where it means nothing, but even if it saves one life, it means the world in this type of ministry. And what's beautiful about this, too, is Calvary Chapel, Cape Coral is a small part of 10,000 lives that were saved since that drive started. What a beautiful thing. Just be in prayer about um, helping them out more this coming year and uh, whatever the Lord leads there. Um, I want to just get us started here with a way of introduction. You know that we're going to be in 1 John chapter 4. So if you want to go ahead and turn there while I talk about what we've looked at before in this book. Remember why this book was written. It was because the Gnostic belief was starting in the church at this time. And John the Apostle, the Apostle of Love, was correcting those false teachings. And by doing so, he didn't focus on the false teaching. That's not how you correct it. He focused on the truth. So the false teaching would be that much more apparent to those followers of Christ that they would not be led astray. And what's really cool about this letter is something that I, I ran across J. Vernon McGee pointing out. He points out that Paul, in all of his letters, first he, wrote, he writes to the pastors of the church. He writes the pastoral letters. And they're instruction of how to be a pastor and how to shepherd the flock that the Lord has, has put you over. But he also wrote the church epistles too, where it's a, a general purpose to the church and correction and doctrine to the church. But John... And 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, John writes to the family. He makes it even more personal. He brings it into, this is a family letter. We're the family of God. Over and over, he refers to our father and that we're little children and that we're, and we're even in different stages of our growth in this family. So that's a beautiful picture and something to remember as we move through this epistle because we're, he's been focusing on the love that should be flowing through us from the father to those around us. And he's been focusing on that since chapter one. And all the way up till now, he's going to come to the climax of that. And then next time that we get to look at this book, we'll be closing out the letter. But remembering what we've looked at before as well, with that love, and the first time that we looked at this book, we, we looked at being light in the darkness, allowing Christ to shine so through us that a dark world would see something different about us and desire it. And then the second time that we looked in here, we looked at growing in Christ, that family unit, and the different stages of growing in Christ. And then again, we looked at seeking after righteousness, wanting to live a different life because of all that he's done for us, to where we are set apart, to where we are seen as a peculiar people. And then the first service that we had after Ian devastated our areas, our area here, we looked at the love of the Father, the love the Father has for us, and what perfect timing for that whenever we were there because we were, we were devastated. But God's perfect time put us at that one verse that we spent an hour looking at that morning and how beautiful that was and how perfectly timed by him. Then the last time that we've looked at the book, we looked at we need to be all about loving others. And that's what John's going to carry on with this morning and go deeper into as the way of agape, that God's love going through us, pouring through us. It's a love that comes from God. It's an unconditional love. But it does need us to accept it, to experience it. It's poured out for everyone in this world and just ask that you accept that love so you can experience it and share it. So with that, we're going to pick up in 1 John. Now, I did mislead you, I guess. I said chapter 4. I do want to 
pick up in the last verse of chapter 3 because that's where he starts setting the stage for the next thing that he says here. So uh, 1 John chapter 3, 24 says, Now he who keeps his commandment, that, is, that commandment is to love one another, abides in him and he in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. We are indwelled with the Spirit of God. If we've accepted what Christ did on our behalf and we've accepted that love that has been poured out for us, he has given us his Spirit to help us overcome the things of this world, to overcome the flesh, to overcome temptation, to, over, to even be good witnesses and to love with a love that is not natural, that cannot come from us. That's all the empower of the Holy Spirit that he has given us. Jesus said, said it this way in John 14, 16, and 17, and I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever, the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. These are powerful words from our Lord, this promise that he gave us that we would be indwelled by the Holy Spirit. And that's the seal, that's the knowing that we have that we are his. His spirit ministers to us and tells us that we're his and that he, he has given his all for us. Paul said it this way in Romans 5, 5. New hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. This Holy Spirit reveals the Father's love to us. It's what caught our attention in the first place. It's what broke us and said, we need you. We've seen how loving he is towards us. From Romans 8, Paul carries on. 8 verse 9, he said, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. God's love, God's agape, refuses to leave a believer in a cruel world without the protection of the Holy Spirit. Agape of God protects us. It guides us through a world that wants nothing to do with us. And it calls us at that same time to love those who are lost. From the very opening of scripture, this has been God's plan to dwell with his people. Right now he's dwelling within us, but we're looking forward to a future too where we're gonna dwell face to face with Christ as our Lord. He's dwelling in us, he's guiding us. Agape, agape is the way he calls us to live, this God's love. It puts others first. It looks at another's need and says, I'll put my need aside to help this one. It's dying to self. Looking to bless others and meeting another's need is where we find ourselves right in the middle of God's will and his calling on our life where we start walking out the very thing we've been created for. God's love for us was at his expense, not ours. And we're gonna look at that even closer here shortly, but, but always keep that in mind, the extent that he went to for you to experience his love. And that sets the stage for where I said that we were starting. Verse 1 through 3 of 1 John. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many spirit, false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that God, that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, 
is of God, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus has come in the flesh is not of God, and this is the spirit of Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. Everything that is spiritual is not of God. Every spiritual experience is not of God. If you think about it, Paul dealt with these same, same things, these false teachings, these, these other ways of being spiritual with the Galatians too because they thought they had to work for this spirituality. They were longing for a spirituality that they could not obtain through their flesh, but what were they doing? After they heard the good news and accepted it, they allowed people to come in and lead them astray and think that they had to work for all of it. And Paul said this, In Galatians 1, 5 through 10, I marvel that you turn away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ. The believers were deceived by this false teaching that had grabbed a hold of them. It's the very thing that John is preventing in his fellowship, that the believers would be deceived and taken astray. Paul goes on to say, to a different gospel. That's instead of the gospel of Christ. That's instead of Christ. That is what anti Christ means. It's taking the place of. And he goes on to say in verse 7, which there is no other. There is no other gospel. Don't be deceived. But there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we, the very ones who brought this to you, even if we are an angel from heaven, preach another gospel to you, then what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As have, as I have said before, so I will say again, if anyone preaches another gospel to you, then what we, you have received, let him be accursed. The truth of God does not change. It will not change. It cannot change. It is done. It is finished, as Christ himself said. There is no obtaining through works. There is no working for our salvation. And we need to be good Bereans. For every teacher that we listen to, including me, standing here, this is why we want you to have a Bible on your lap, reading every word that we're saying, and we use one translation as we go through the word, so we're not manipulating. You get some spiritual books nowadays that call themselves Christianity and Christian teachings, and they'll use every type of translation out there so they can take a twist on what's being said, pull it out of context, and make it fit what they want to say rather than just revealing what the Word says. That is not of God. That is man doing his own thing. We need to be very careful with YouTube as well. There's some good stuff on YouTube. I actually pay YouTube so I don't have commercials because I listen to a lot of good teaching and seminary stuff through YouTube. But there's a lot of bad stuff on there. Even the discernment ministries that are on there, if you pay attention to most of those discernment ministries, it comes down to we know it all and everybody else is wrong. That's not discernment. That's leading astray again. We need to be very careful of every book that comes our way, even by another believer. Good intentioned believer may be led astray themselves and give you something that is not of God. Allow the Holy Spirit to lead everything that you read and that it mirrors what God has said. How do you do that? By feeding the Spirit that dwells within you, by staying in His Word, knowing the truth, then error becomes very apparent when it comes up. What's amazing to me Even TV shows that people are going after are very far off. And we'll talk about how that gets, gets people off in just a second a little bit more. But just think of a new believer, how much the enemy loves to get them off with these little subtleties. What did he do in the garden? Did God really say? And even tempting our Lord, he used scripture, but he twisted it. He perverted it. Wanted it to say something that it didn't say. Christ, our Lord, responded with Scripture in its proper form, which is exactly what we need to do. We need to know the Word to where we can't be deceived by it being twisted. When I was a new believer, I seen this stuff happen. I've told you before, I was in a, a rehab program, and there was a lot of different stuff that went on in there, and I was. I was exposed to this guy, Charlie Dyer. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of him. It's nobody to look up, I promise you. But he kind of blends a bunch of faiths together. He's, he calls himself a Hindu, Buddhist, Christian, which doesn't work. 
<laughs> but he's new age. He blends it all together. And he'll tell you that everything that Christ said is true. Just like the, the Hindus will say that too. Yeah, we'll accept your Christ and we'll put him right here with all these other gods. Everything that he said is true. The problem is he's not the truth. He's not the way. He's not the life. He's one of many. That's no good. This very test that John just gave us is good for a lot of groups that will try to deceive us out there. The Jehovah Witnesses sound great whenever you're talking to them and listening until you start really digging into who Jesus is. It's this very test that John just gave us. It wasn't God coming in the flesh. It was a created being that came and died for you. That doesn't work either. Many of them believe that it was Michael the archangel even. And the same thing with the Mormons. They take our Jesus and they use our words, salvation and all this. All of it has a completely different meaning than what we know by scripture. This Jesus was just a man who became God through his works. And that you can do the same. You can be equal with Christ through your works by the way that you live. That is blasphemy, and that is not the Jesus of the scriptures. Something very important that I, else that I want to bring up that has been something that's crept into the church that doesn't get addressed with these two, the two tests that he gives us here, but it needs to be spoken about. A believer, someone who trusts in what Christ did on the cross for you and has the Holy Spirit dwelling within them the Holy Spirit has locked the door behind him. You cannot be possessed by any demonic spirit if you are in Christ. You can be oppressed. You can be tormented. You can be bothered. And what happens there is when someone longs for more than what God has already given them as a believer. And this is something that is seen. I've talked with people, I've ministered to people, I've cried over people who longed for something more than God's word. They wanted more than what's on the pages of scripture. As a matter of fact, that's one way that a TV show can lead your way astray. His fellowship through the indwelling of his spirit, that he's closer than your next breath is not enough for them they want to be able to touch, to feel. They want more than what God offers. And the reason they want more is because they have no understanding of what they have. And they open themselves up to deceit. Now remember, John wrote this because the Gnostics was the issue that he was dealing with. So that's why he lays out this test the way that he does, because they were saying that anything that was of flesh, anything material was evil, and everything that was spirit, get that, everything that was spirit was good and was going to continue and be good from there on. So God himself, being spirit, could not take on flesh and become mortal because he would therefore become evil. These are the same deceits that these other two that we just talked about do. It's the same logic. The problem with this is anything other than God putting on flesh lessens who he is. If he was just a phantom, let me adjust this, that's what I keep hearing. If he was just a phantom and he was just a spirit and could not be and was not human, he couldn't address the very things that Christ came to address. He couldn't have saved us from the penalty of our sins because a phantom could not die the death that I deserve. And he could not overcome the grave. Not only that, he could not have been tested in the way that we are tested and overcome the flesh and sin either because he wasn't even part of it. So you see, anytime that you start reworking God or making him into who you want him to be, Christ loses something. He loses who he really is. He stops being the God that can save you and he's just a God of your own creation. 
which every one of us had prior to coming to him. Many, for many of us, including me, I was God. <laughs> I had put myself in those shoes. The Jehovah Witnesses and the Mormons allow a God that cannot save them to be the guy that they worship and run after. And every one of these, including the Hindus that say that all of it's true and you can set him here with all these other gods, miss one very important line in scripture. There's many, but this one just settles it. Jesus said, after I am the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father except by me. He is not a God among other gods. He is God of all. Ended. Now, he goes on to talk about the spirit of Antichrist there. John had warned us about this earlier back in 1 John 2, that the spirit of Antichrist was among them and already in the world, and he has been ever since the beginning of time because he does not know when things are going to end. Christ said himself, I do not know the day or the hour, neither does Satan, so he's always got to have somebody in the ready to step into that void when it comes, whenever the world is perfectly ready to accept someone who's got all the answers and step onto the main stage. We're looking at that time right now, I believe. The, re the world is prime for somebody to come with the answers to this mess that we're in the middle of. And he does have somebody ready, as he always have, has. And we need to be on guard for the counterfeit. The best way, as I said earlier, to know counterfeit is to know the truth. Then the counterfeit's very obvious. Verse 4 says, You are of God, little children. And you have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. This is one that should be on all of our refrigerators. It should be on our lips all the time because we're constantly attacked. And we need to be reminded the one who dwells in us is greater than any of those arrows that come at us. And we will overcome any deceit that comes our way if we are in him. Even if we've opened ourselves up to it, he longs to pull us out of that. John writes this to the family of God, remember. And he is greater. Your father is greater. Your dad will not allow you to be misled any longer than it is good for you, as a matter of fact. And I say it that way because I know for a fact that the little misleading, the sidestep that I took at the very beginning of my walk with Christ has been used many times since then when something we're looking at something and all of a sudden some words fly right off the page at me. This comes from that other stuff. I've got to throw it all away because that doesn't line up with Scripture. He's used that misstep for me to see error real quick in a lot of things. And he'll do that if you messed up too, but like, a, like it says here, he is greater than those errors and longs to pull you back. Verse five says, they are of the world, therefore they speak as of the world and the world hears them. We are of God. He who knows God hears us, that being John and the rest of the apostles, hears us, he who is not of God, does not hear us. Paul warns the same thing to Timothy. In 2 Timothy, think about it, that false teaching will become more and more popular. And this is the same thing that's being spoken of here. The world as a whole will run after the false teachers. You and I should be aware. 2 Timothy 4, 3, 3 and 4 says it this way. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. We are there. That's on full display. But after their own lust, shall they heap up to themselves teachers having itchy ears. They shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. Ever notice how large of a following false teachers do have in the world today? I mean, think of all of the, the false teachers Oprah Winfrey put on display and made sure that they were number one bestsellers. 
The world longs for this stuff, if you think about it, that's why. They've got an itch that they can't scratch in the flesh. They are seeking after something spiritual and being deceived because they open themselves up to all of it. That spiritual itch they think is being settled when they go after the occult. Psychic readings, watching these paranoia, par paranormal television shows, and even tarot cards. I don't know, again, I mentioned YouTube earlier, and I'm not on TikTok or anything like that, but these little blurbs come up all the time, they want me to follow down these little rabbit holes, and that's one of the big thing all the kids are into today, are tarot cards. It's very obvious by the stuff that they keep, and it's funny because they see I'm into spiritual things, so they think, oh, this is right up his alley. We'll, we'll give this to him. False spirituality is on display. And so many of the Christian, so-called Christian teachings today are not about Christ at all. They are about how great you can be, how rich you can be, how you can be in charge of your own destiny, and how you are worth everything to you. The Word of God builds us up, but does it in a completely different way by humbling ourselves, knowing that He is God and I am not, and I could not save myself, it took Him to do it. Then all of a sudden I see my worth in a completely different way than the world looks at it when I look at the extent that my father went through to save me from myself. Verse six just told us that John and the other apostles are of God and that is the very reason that the world cannot hear them and we know the world does not hear them or their teachings because what do they say about this book? That we find our Lord in that we commun he communicates to us from. They say it's a book of hate. Everything that I open up, everything I read in there is nothing but love pouring off of every page. It takes a long leap to call that hate. But that's exactly how it's displayed to the world today. That's because they've got itchy ears that are closed. Their eyes are closed and their hearts are closed. They refuse to hear the love, and they turn it into hate. True teaching says my riches and your riches, if you're in Christ, are found in him, nothing in this world. And when I'm in control of my own destiny, I make a mess no matter what the world sees. The world wants to listen to these false teachers. And look at that, that last sentence in verse 6 again, too. By this, we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. There's that second test that he gave us. What are they chasing after? What is that, that teacher putting on full display? Is it a self-help? Is it a self-indulging? Or is it a magnifying of how great God is and how much he loves you? Is it doctrine found in Scripture or doctrine found in the world itself? By this, we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Are they teaching sound doctrine? Now, moving on, verse seven, uh, verses 7 and 8 shows us agape is to be shared. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Love one another is a commandment directly from our Lord's lips. From John 13, 35. And what's so amazing about that commandment, too, he followed it up by saying, by this, all will know that we're his. What could that possibly mean? So we can see unbelievers that seem very loving at times. What would make us so different? The 
fact that it's not a worldly love that Christ is talking about. The love that we're to show one another and to a lost world is a love that can only come from Father through us to them. It's not something that we can work up. It's completely unnatural to our flesh. And it's also our ministry. It's the very thing that he has us here for as believers is to love one another. And just think about this. This is how ministry even starts. Before we can come in here and minister, we have to be loving what should be the easiest, our spouse and our children and our inside of our home. We should be loving with agape love. This love that's not expecting something in return. It's not a give and take. So I'm doing this because I love you this much. And I'm putting you first and me second. And when we get it right in the home, then we can come in here and we can share it with the group, the family, and allow him to flow through us and love one another through us. And if we're doing it right in here, what does that mean? The world's gonna see something very different about us. That when we go out there to an unlovable unlove- world, we can love them in the power of Christ, not in our strength. This is building on everything that John has been saying all the way through this book. We must love one another out of a true love for the lost as well. The love, this love is motivated by the Spirit. It's not in our control. It's for us to allow to happen. It is God at work in us And verse 8 says, he who does not love, he who cannot love our agape does not know God, which is true. How can you love with God's love if he's not dwelling in you, doing it through you? According to 1 John 1, 3, we have fellowship with Jesus and the Father and we're indwelled by his spirit. Agape is what we should be known by. It's been said so many times that you and I are the only Bible some people will read. When they look at me, I have to ask myself, when they say, that's what a Christian looks like, is that what my Lord wants me to look like? Am I showing the love of God in everything that I'm doing with them? We are to be loving and not work it up, not something that we create, but just allow him to do it through us. 9 and 11, agape was shown already and given an example. Verse 9. In this, the love of God was manifest towards us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loves us, loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God the Father. But look at what it says in verse nine. He was manifest towards us. His love, through his love, he was manifest toward us. He was on full display by the incarnation of Christ. That God the Father gave this sin-filled world his only son. So we, the created, could hold court over the very creator and condemn him for our own sins. We laid our sins on the only righteous Jesus, the God-man. And his love was displayed by that. When we look at 
the last line. You look at that last line in verse 9, that we might live through him. All this he did so we could live through him. What could that possibly mean? It means that when the Father looks at us, he refuses to see our failures. He only sees the righteousness of Christ because we've accepted what he did. What loving Father do we have? That he would go to such an extent, at his expense, for those who did not want anything to do with him. I am viewed by the righteousness of Christ and no less. This is earth shaking. This is life changing. This is what love looks like. And we are a hard hearted people if we can continue as if nothing has happened. After we see this, we experience it, we accept it, and just continue on with our hard heartedness. And I may be the hard heartedest of all because I see this, I know this to be true with every ounce of my body and I still allow my flesh to guide me from time to time. And when I'm being led by the flesh, there is no way that I am exhibiting agape love. But thank God for verse 10 because that goes on to explain it's not about me. He wants to break me. He wants me to allow his spirit to guide me and quit relying on my flesh. But it's not about me. This agape was not based on my response. It was poured out on us and this world because it's his nature to love in such a way. And what's beautiful about that, too, is Agape did not wait for everybody to get things right, to get themselves together before it was poured out. It was poured out on this lost and dying world to make a way back to God for the very enemies of this loving God. It was not the love that, of us that moved him. It was him loving us that moved him to act. In his love, he moved towards us in our direction while we wanted him removed from our lives. Wanted to just live a life and be free of all this. Wanted to have the fun that we want to have and not think of this restricting God that we didn't think of as so loving at that time. And what did he say about that? Not only on the cross, but I know he said it about me. I'm sure he said it about you at one point. I'll still forgive them because they know not yet what they do. That's agape love that we're supposed to be demonstrating. Paul said the same thing in Romans 5, which we looked at one verse from. Why don't we all turn to Romans 5? And we're going to pick up in verse 5 once you get there. Verse 5, now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For when we were still without strength, we were without strength, we were defeated, we were without hope. For when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly, that was us. That was you and I. Verse 7. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man someone would dare to die. But God demonstrated his own love towards us. In that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood we shall be saved from the wrath through him. Again, the Father sees us through Christ-colored glasses. His righteousness is all that he sees when he looks at us if we're in him. 
Verse 10, for if we were enemies, we're reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have received the reconciliation. Let's go back to 1 John chapter 4. His life is accounted to each one of us, not our own. Every one of our failures were placed on him. If we are in Christ, our sin will never be accounted to us. He paid the payment in full. It said his propitiation. He made the propitiation. That is a payment of a debt. In the time of Christ, if you needed money, you could sell yourself into slavery and get the money that you need and then work it off over time until you were free again. We had a debt and we were enslaved to something that we could never work off. For a million years, all we would have done was dig ourselves deeper and deeper into debt. Christ stepped in and made the payment in full is what First John is proclaiming here. In verse 11, calls us to live the life of agape. We are to love the brothers and sisters that we are in service with. We can love the unloving, unlovable out there once we get our home and our fellowship right. And we are commanded to do so. There is no gray area on this. That's one of the good things about these letters, the epistles. There's no gray area. These, they're just straightforward. You don't get to play with the words. You don't get to change the meaning. Again, and now next, 12 through 16. Agape is security. Verse 12. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love has been perfected in us. If we love one another, it demonstrates our fellowship with the Father. And his spirit at work in us. That word, perfect, perfected, it's perfected in us. Boy, I don't represent that too often. But the, the real meaning behind that word is tell L O, T E L E I O O. And that means to reach a goal. It means to take something that's broken, remove it, and replace it with something that works perfectly. God's goal was for us to accept the love that He poured out for us. And when we do that, we are to share with others that love that he has for them. Verse 13, by this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given his spirit and we have seen and testify that the father has sent the son as savior of the world. Whoever confesses the son or confesses that Jesus is the son of God, God abides in him and he in God. And he, and we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. And we abide, and he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. God is love, and there is no greater love than all in all the universe. No one has went to such lengths and giving or given up more to show what love is for you and I than the Father has. God is love. God is love. Make sure we always get that right. So unfortunately, preparing this, I ran across a lot of things that said love is God. It's not worded that way, and that's for a reason. When you say it that way, you actually diminish who God is again. He's so much more than that. He is love. He's perfect love. He is the demonstration of what agape love is. 
But to reverse that, you take away so much of what else he is. He is so much greater and so much more. 17 through 19, agape is fearless. 17, love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, uh, excuse me, in judgment because as he is, so we are in this world loving. It's what we're to be in this world. And remember, that's a demonstration that he dwells within us, that we have fellowship with him, so we have no fear of his judgment. His judgment's gonna come on those who have rejected that love. Verse 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment, but he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. We are in this world at this time for a purpose. And if you watch your news, if you just look outside your front door and what's going on out there, we are ripe for judgment. We have no reason to fear it. We are his. Seeing the time drawing near, though, of this judgment should spark that love in such a way that we can't let one person go past us without hearing the truth and love of God. If that's what the Spirit guides us for that person. Because others, I've got to make sure I say that properly. There are times where I've been told not to say anything because I could mess something up God's doing. But think about this too. I love that I learned this a while back that every time that I am sharing what God has done on our behalf, that we're, we are always entering into a conversation the Holy Spirit's already having with that person. Be led by the Spirit, not by your flesh, is what I'm trying to say. Seeing that day draw closer, we need to be the most loving people on the face of this earth because we know the truth, we know the love. And this world, the people of this world are screaming for love in a way they never have before, if you think about it too. This world is offended by things out of their control and out of the control of the people doing the offending. This world needs what we have. They need this agape, and they need to be changed by it, and they need their eternity secure in it. Agape is the way of the believer, 20 through 22. If anyone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. Again, no gray area there. Or family, and that's the way it should be treated. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. John doesn't dance around these words. He doesn't leave us room to twist them. We're called to love. We're called to be a loving people. And if we're born again, then we should be loving one another. I believe some of us in this room are probably right there with me saying, I could do more. I know that I fell at this. But our Heavenly Father wants to be able to work through us. It's all about where our focus is. Is it on our flesh, my need, or is it what God's called me to? And that starts in our home, like I said, where it should be very easy to show agape love and allow the Lord to work through us so it can then be poured out in here. As we do it in here, it just overflows out into that world. This world has itching ears and is crying out for love at the same time they're pushing this agape love away. We're going to share in the Lord's Supper. 
I'm going to ask that you join me in praying about where we are with this because this is not only a test about a false teacher. It's not only a test about how you find those falsities. It's actually a test of where our heart is and where we are in our walk by our love that we're demonstrating for one another. Now, as the elements get handed out, I ask that you go into prayer about that. I ask the Lord to reveal to you exactly where you are as he prayerfully already has. You guys come forward and pass out the elements.